welcome everyone. Uh, on behalf of Director John Adler at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar titled Beyond Patrol 2, Courtroom Personnel, School Resource Officers, and University Police. This webinar focuses on body-worn cameras and their implementation and use beyond what could be considered traditional or standard patrol roles. My name is Tom Woodmansey, and I'm a Senior Advisor for CNA in the Bureau of Justice Assistance Body-Worn Camera Technical Assistance Program. I'm also a former police officer. So I'm going to provide a brief introduction to today's webinar and also introduce our panelists. Uh, today's webinar will cover the following topics, a discussion on body-worn camera research and officers' perceptions, a discussion on the benefits, limitations, and best practices of implementing body-worn camera with specialized personnel, units, and specialized agencies. We'll have a review and discussion of lessons learned from best practices to what challenges and obstacles obtained from the field can be. We'll also provide information on how the body-worn camera TTA team uh, has and can assist you during deployment. This webinar is another in a series of webinars sponsored by the Bureau of Justice Assistance and coordinated by CNA for the Body Worn Camera Technical Assistance Program. We thank the Bureau of Justice Assistance for its investment in the Body Worn Camera Grant Program, the Body Worn Camera Toolkit, and in a range of technical assistance resources and opportunities for agencies throughout the country uh, that are implementing their body worn cameras. The Bureau supports state, county, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies in many, many ways, and we are grateful that they do so. I'd also like to thank the staff at CNA for their efforts in putting this webinar together. So just a few additional comments before we start. Uh, this, the webinar will be recorded for the benefit of others who want to view it later and post it on our website. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the webinar, so please make your thoughts and questions known. Uh, if you'd like. And you may use the chat utility to the right of your screen to post your questions and comments, or you can comment at the end of the webinar, and we'll do our best to respond uh, to your input. Following the webinar, you'll receive a request to evaluate it. So if you wouldn't mind completing the evaluation, give us your honest thoughts and recommendations. And also, let us know what other topics you think would be good for us to cover on future webinars. So I'd like to now introduce uh, our panelists. We're really fortunate to have a, an outstanding group of four pa panelists and experts for this webinar. I'll start with uh, Jan Gobb. Dr. Gobb is an assistant professor in the Department of Criminal Justice at East Carolina University and serves on the Arizona State Training and Technical Assistance Team as a subject ad expert for body-worn cameras. Jan has managed a number of large police research project projects, including multi-site randomized controlled trial of body-worn cameras, and she continues to work directly with police departments in several capacities. Her research focuses on police misconduct, technology, use of force, and the effect of gender in policing. Dr. Gobb was also one of the authors of a report on body-worn cameras, which is on today's topic, and the report was titled Beyond Patrol. Exploring Perceptions of Body-Worn Cameras Among Officers in Specialized Units. The report was published just last year, and you'll see it referenced in this webinar, and I highly recommend that the audience take a look at it if you get the opportunity. Robert Wolsey. Uh, Lieutenant Wolsey has served over 20 years of law enforcement experience and currently works for the City of Las Vegas Marshall Unit as an operations lieutenant. During his career, Robert has worked both as a marshal and a police officer in a variety of assignments, uh, and he is a law enforcement instructor and participated in the development of active shooter response training and has developed and implemented the Marshall Unit Body Worn Camera Program. Lieutenant Woolsey holds a bachelor's and master's degree in public administration and is completing his doctorate in organizational leadership. Eric Villarreal has 11 years of policing. Uh, the sergeant is currently a supervisor for training department for the Laredo Independent School District Police Department. He was a former chief of police uh, in, in the department from 2013 to 2014, and he has worked with multiple grants for law enforcement in the state and federal level. Our final presenter is Ed Book. Chief Book has been the chief at the Santa Fe College in Gainesville, Florida since 2011. He has over 33 years of experience in policing, and he serves as the College Emergency Manager and Behavioral Intervention Team Chair. 
Chief Book has a master's degree in educational leadership and is also a member of numerous law enforcement organizations. So I want to thank the panel for being able to provide their expertise in contributing to this webinar. We greatly appreciate it. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gobb to start us off. Uh, go ahead and take it over, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so as Tom mentioned, my name is Dr. Gobb. I'm uh, Jan. I'm from East Carolina University, and, and I also am a subject matter expert with the ASU Training and Technical Assistance Team. And the research I'm going to talk about today um, was also conducted with the assistant, a three-person team, uh, myself and then Dr. Mike White at ASU and uh, Dr. Natalie Todak from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. So I felt I should give them credit where credit is due as well. Um, so my, as Tom mentioned, my purpose here is to talk about the research surrounding body cameras outside of standard patrol units. Um, so we'll start with some background. As, as many of you probably well remember, um, body cameras really started proliferating on a, on a rapid basis um, following high-profile incidents in 2014, 2015, and continuing uh, for several years. Um, and because of this rapid proliferation of, of cameras, there was very little empirical guidance for program implementation, which meant that a lot of departments were basically flying blind um, or, or almost blind. Um, in, in the process of implementing cameras. And so many researchers quickly wanted to, to conduct rigorous studies of body cameras and their effects. And so they focused on a few core questions, those big ticket items of use of force, complaints, and, and injuries, but also what did people think about the, the technology? What did officers think about it? What did citizens think about them? Um, and also what did people outside of the police department think about cameras? So, courtroom actors, uh, fire rescue, um, city government, who, those external stakeholders, what did they think about it? And then also, what were some of the uses of, of cameras in training and de-escalation? Well, what you'll notice from, from a lot of that research is that most of those studies focus on patrol divisions in medium or large police departments and municipal police departments. And, and the reasons for that are, are logical. Um, Patrol division makes sense. Most police departments were implementing, at least at first, among the patrol officers, because those are, it's the largest division, it's the one, it's the people who are going to have the most contact with the public. Medium or large police departments also make sense, as well as municipal police departments, from a research perspective, because it gives, uh, it gives researchers the sample size necessary for rigorous experiments. Um, one notable exception of this is Pelfrey and Keener in 2016 conducted uh, focus groups and a survey of university police officers um, and to assess their perceptions. But aside from that, um, studies have focused primarily on, on, again, those patrol divisions and medium or large municipal police departments. Importantly, body cameras in courts and in K-12 schools have not been studied, which is an important but unfortunately overlooked research question. So the current study that I'm going to be talking about is uh, it's in the context of a much larger study that we conducted, a multi-site randomized control trial of the Spokane, Washington, and Tempe, Arizona Police Departments, which are hit basically all of those things that I just said was a, a drawback of most current research, which is that they implemented cameras among the, the patrol divisions in two medium-sized municipal police departments. However, this, this, the sub-study I'm going to be talking about does talk about um, specialized units. So the, this larger study was funded by the Laura and John Arnold Foundation. Uh, the, the departments allowed us to take what had been planned to be a phased rollout due to logistical concerns and other reasons um, and turn it into a randomized controlled trial. They essentially allowed us to randomly, through a lottery system, assign who would receive cameras first. Um, so for six months, uh, half, about half of the patrol division received cameras, and six months later, the other half also received their cameras, and then everyone had cameras. Um, so the deployment dates for the two departments are on the screen. You can see that Tempe lagged about six months, um, which was due to procurement and another, a few other reasons, but actually was very useful for us from a practical standpoint. Um, but the, what I'm going to talk about today is our semi-structured focus groups that we conducted with specialized units in both cities. It's important to note that, that these units were considered 
part of the patrol division in both de in both departments. Um, so they did receive cameras as part of the RCT. So they were also, you know, included in that random random assignment. Um, but they are very much specialized units. They are not your standard patrol units. So we asked them about the benefits and drawbacks of cameras, both generally and for their depart uh, their units. Also, we all wanted to know what they felt the challenges were to integrating body cameras into their particular workflow and what they viewed to be the unique considerations that de departments should think about when they're looking to implement cameras to specialty units. So the, uh, the units that we talked to are listed here on the screen. You'll see that some of them are the same. You know, everybody has a traffic unit. <laughs> um, they, we talked to the K-9 units in both and the SWAT units in both. A few of them are different. Uh, we talked to the dignitary unit in Spokane. They actually did not have cameras, but we wanted to know why. And then we talked to the detectives unit, which is the plainclothes criminal investigations bureau detectives unit. Um, at the time, KMP was the only department that we were aware of that had implemented body cameras to this, these, plain, these types of plainclothes detectives. Um, and they actually were not part of the RCT. They were deployed in what Tempe called phase three. Um, and they weren't part of other parts of our study, but we wanted to include them here because we felt that their perspectives could be really useful and could, were relatively unique. So when we talk about the benefits of body cameras and we talk to officers, often we'll hear similar things. Um, and, and when we talk to these specialty units, we heard a lot of the same things from general patrol officers, you know, the value that with evidence, the fact that it's a better record of what happened in an encounter. Um, when we hear, especially with sergeants, we hear that it helps with complaints. But we also heard that several things that were either unit-specific or a very specific flavor, if you will, um, with documenting charges or documenting the sometimes many steps that they would take prior to using force. And again, these are specialized units. Many of these units are statistically more likely to use force than your standard patrol officers. Um, but they would often document these many, many steps they had taken prior to using force. Um, the, the important training uses for them or some of these innovative ways that they were able to use cameras, they also mentioned. So when we talk about documenting charges, um, it's important to remember that some of these units, in the case would also be could also be made for, for officers in K-12 schools or in universities or in courthouses and courtrooms. Um, they're dealing with really specific types of encounters that are not kind of your standard, right? Um, so in this, these, in this particular instance here, um, it's the bike squad, and they deal, well, they deal with what would be a rel relatively minor issue, you know, disorderly conduct. Everyone deals with disorderly conduct at some point. Um, the types of disorderly conduct they deal with are very kind of unique. They patrol the downtown area of Tempe, um, in particular a stretch of Mill Avenue that combines, at least on the weekend evenings, combines large amounts of alcohol with large amounts of college students. And so they deal with a lot of fights, as you can imagine. Um, and as they like to explain, it was, it, on a written report, it would be two guys fighting in the road. And with cameras, it look how much chaos this causes, because it's not just too much two guys fighting in the road or on the side of the road. It's two guys fighting on the side of the road that then spills out into the street and blocks traffic, and there's 50 people around, and it just becomes chaotic. And so cameras really allowed to allowed them to capture that <clears throat> and document exactly why they were charging the way they were. And we heard this from numerous um, agent, uh, units within our focus groups. Also, the training capabilities. Training, um, cameras hold immense uh, potential for, for use in training. Um, we heard from the bike, bike unit again. They, they conduct a bike school for officers that want to become bike cops. And so they use several stock videos, essentially. Um, they they kind of keep a stockpile of, of videos of, of themselves doing things correctly and doing things incorrectly to show the students examples of what they're trying to teach them. I mean, so they rotate them through the bike school. We also heard from K9, the K9 units, and they they would they could use the videos, um, just standard videos of encounters. They could pull the video to show, like a master trainer, how the dog wasn't maybe responding how they wanted to, or wasn't responding to certain types of commands, and show the video of the dog doing whatever the problematic behavior was. And the master trainer could go through and say, okay, let's try this and let's do this, you know, because 
dogs apparently are like cars, and when you take the car to the mechanic, it never makes the noise you want it to make, and dogs were the same way, we were told, that they never did what they wanted them to do in front of the master trainer. Um, in terms of the innovative uses, um, we heard from the crisis negotiator in Spokane, or a crisis negoti negotiator in Spokane. Um, Spokane has several bridges, and they often have problems with people trying to jump off the bridges and commit suicide. Um, the crisis negotiators are called in in those situations, and they were, they're were they able to use the cameras, basically take it off the chest mount, and um, in this case, they zip-tied it to a post. They could back up from this individual who was exceptionally agitated. Um, they could use the, they used the phone, um, the app and the smartphone, to be able to, to communicate with the person. They could still respond to those nonverbal cues, um, and then, but they could talk from a distance and ultimately bring that to a peaceful resolution. We heard other, other instances of, of um, SWAT units or other units using them, taking them off the chest mount often and using them to look over fences or around corners or into attics without having to themselves get in those somewhat vulnerable, vulnerable positions. When we talk about drawbacks of cameras, again, we heard some of the same things with patrol officers, um, you know, the increased workload, the idea that People don't take officers at their word. If it's not on camera, it didn't happen, right? But several things that became, that were shown to be unique needs for specialized units. The idea of technical components and take home vehicles causing some concerns. And then what about public access to tactics? What exactly are we even recording on video? And then how are these incidents viewed and consumed by the public? So when we talk about technical components and take-home vehicles, again, many of these units have take-home vehicles, and so they don't generally um, work coming into uh, the, the precinct or the station as the first stop the, during the day or even the last stop during the day. And so when they had cameras introduced to them, they had to kind of rework their workflow to account for that, and especially if they had instances where over the maybe over a weekend or a, a you know holiday weekend or something, they had done like the traffic officers talking about DUI enforcement shifts, and they might do multiple stops over several shifts over a weekend, and then they have many many videos that have to be uploaded on Monday morning. Um, the, the same would be true for other uh, and other units that have take home vehicles. It, it is it required an adjustment to their workflow. In terms of technical components, um, many of the, the units work primarily at night in the dark. And so things like a flashing green light gives away their position and would give away who they were, that they were, off, that they were police officers, if they were conducting surveillance or trying to, to plan a tactic. Um, so the, the, this SWAT officer said that they solved that problem by taping it, but they were not actually supposed to be supposed to do that according to their policy. And so sometimes uh, what, one of our recommendations is that policies may need to be adjusted, and, so, and this is one instance where perhaps a, a policy adjustment needed to be made um, to allow for, for changes that are somewhat unique to those units. In terms of public access to tactics, this came up a lot with SWAT officers and canine officers. We hear it pretty regularly from these two departments as, and from others as well, being concerned about um, open footage being open to public records requests and the idea that their tactics could be used against them, um, that or circumvented in some way. It was it was a co commonly mentioned in the particularly those two types of units, SWAT and canine, um, about public access. And in the same vein, kind of what is captured on video? So you know, what are we capturing on video? We're capturing tactics, and that's available to the public. We're also capturing other things that are potentially problematic. Um, the police anti crime team in Spokane does wear cameras and their primary job is to work with confidential informants. They turn confidential informants and then they, they kind of are in charge of them. And so they were concerned that they, all of these encounters were going to be available for public, public, public requests and would put their confidential informants in danger. And as you can see here, this officer says it's only going to take once and it's going to get someone killed and we're going to be on the hook for it. They were exceptionally concerned with the safety of their confidential informants and also that it would make people not want to be confidential informants for fear of their own safety. And kind of in the same vein, how are these incidents being perceived by the public? Again, specialized units often deal with encounters that are not the norm. They're not 
encounters that people see on a regular basis, especially units, they're, they're often units that are statistically likely, more likely to use force as well. And so these types of incidents aren't, people aren't used to seeing them. And then you're putting them in a jury trial. You're giving them out as part of public records requests. And the officers were very concerned that a normal and textbook example encounter would be blown out of proportion or misunderstood. Um, this particular canine officer was talking about if they got sued or had a, and had a jury trial, but it would, he later said, it would be true for just an, a standard jury trial as well. But you can have an expert that's talked about, has done dog uh, canine for, for many years and say that's what it should look like. The dog did exactly what the dog was supposed to do. The handler did exactly what the handler was supposed to do. And the jury's going to look at it and say nobody should have to go through that because it looks brutal on video. And so certain types of encounters and certain types of events maybe aren't really useful to be put in public, in the public eye. In terms of some recommendations we came up with with this, and, and a lot of these would, would translate well to the, the K-12 schools, universities, and also body cameras in court contexts, um, considering technical aspects individually for units and understanding the challenges that those units are facing, and then adjusting administrative policy as necessary. Um, you know, there are certain, certain situations that these types of units encounter that the standard patrol officer does not or doesn't have, encounter as frequently, um, and so maybe those issues aren't really at the forefront of, of policymakers or policymakers' minds when they, when they craft administrative policy, but they should be when you're putting them on a specialized unit. This is also true for, for K-12 or university or, or courts. Things like privacy differences. Um, you might have encounters in a courtroom or in court context or at a K-12 school where the, the privacy issues play a, a different role or, or a bigger role. Um, maybe you need to make some adjustments to policy for those types of situations. Especially universe, uh, general police departments putting SROs in schools. You may have to make an administrative policy distinction for those those officers. Managing public expectations is also really important. What can they expect to see on video? What will those videos look like? What things might not be video recorded? Um, or now with mute buttons, what might not they not hear, right? Um, all of these things are really important to, to come out from in front of uh, before it becomes a larger issue. And finally, body cameras may not be appropriate for all units or in all instances. We all know that d discretion to some degree is important, um, but in some cases, certain units might need a greater latitude or greater level of discretion than other units um, or general patrol might need, and some may, it may be altogether inappropriate for them to wear them because the issues are just too, too great. And as Tom mentioned, we did put together a report. Um, it's available on the TTA website as well as the body Work camera toolkit. You can also email me for it, or if you have any questions, you're welcome to email me as well. Um, thanks for listening to the research portion. Um, I will now pass it along to Lieutenant Woolby. So from my perspective, we're looking at it, uh, the rollout of a body-worn camera system within a courthouse environment. Obviously, uh, courthouses are slightly different than the standard patrol environment would be, and so we had to, to make a concerted effort to see how we could roll a program like this into kind of a specialized law enforcement environment that deals with things that typically we wouldn't see out in the field. Give you some background. Uh, Marshal's office uh, is the law enforcement section of our court here in the city of Las Vegas, responsible for providing sentencing integrity and public safety services to our judiciary and our judges. And we have two very highly specialized sections that are split up in the court. Uh, one is court services, and the other one is the field services unit. We initially were early adopters of the body-worn camera program. Back in 2015, uh, following Ferguson and some of those other high-profile events that had occurred, we had reviewed, along with the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, the opportunities that were provided to us uh, from some of our vendors, as well as looking at what the benefit would be to our local agencies and the Valley here in Las Vegas as a whole. It was until 2017 that Nevada, the state, followed suit and put out Senate bill, which is now 
uh, law that directs all law enforcement agencies within the state of Nevada that have contact with the public to use body-worn cameras. And there are a couple of different things that they wanted us to do specifically, one of which was develop policies and procedures that address the camera activation, prohibit recording of general activities, protections for privacy, and rules for officers. It also requested that we put in there a mechanism for public requests for video uh, and decide how we would do that and how we would save or, or store that video so that way the information on it or the metadata would remain confidential and could not be tampered with. So looking at that uh, and seeing the difference between what our partners at Las Vegas Metro were doing and other Valley law enforcement agencies, we had to first look at um, the differences between our organization and those others. To go a little bit deeper into the court services unit. Uh, it's responsible strictly for the safety and security of the court system, including the staff, judges, and all the patrons that come and go. Uh, there's seven different courtrooms that we cover. There's a marshal assigned to each. They typically work both inside the field or inside the courthouse and also in the field assignments. They're supervised by sergeants and judges, which is a unique scenario for us. Uh, their duties vary somewhat, but the big thing is they provide security and safety for nearly 13,000 court sessions per year. Uh, and when you start to figure in the amount of people that are attending a court session, uh, sometimes we're upward of uh, 30 to 50 people per court session. It becomes quite a bit of public interaction that those folks do, uh, and they have to manage their interactions with the public differently, obviously, than they would with court security or court personnel uh, and judges. Uh, policing role. They do misdemeanor warrants, uh, subpoenas. They supervise alternative sentencing and, and house arrest and probation, uh, but they also do probable cause arrest, um, things that occur uh, in and around the courthouse and in their general uh, patrol areas. So there are nine people assigned to that. Uh, there's four two-person units, uh, which essentially work together out in the field. There's a floater, we call them, uh, that works inside the courthouse that actually takes care of walk-in warrants and will respond to uh, criminal uh, events that occur. Uh, we also have somebody assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force as a task force officer with the FBI. Uh, and then those marshals will also, as I said with the court, marshals can rotate and they will go in and cover courtroom assignments as needed. Uh, to give you an idea of what the kind of work that they push out, they provide service on nearly 65,000 court orders per year. So, again, they stay very busy, uh, and that's about the number of defendants that they would come in contact with, but that does not include things like third-party people, such as family members or roommates or just the general public um, outside of what their normal duties are. So, again, very high number of interaction with the public and something we really wanted to make sure we captured. So looking at the differences between what we do and what a traditional police department would do, we had to really look at or ask ourselves three main questions. And they were simply, how do we implement uh, the body-worn camera program? And it's not only effective, what we do, but can also cover every aspect of the agency as a whole because we didn't want to segregate out our policy terribly much. We wanted to make sure that it was comprehensive for everyone involved. Uh, but also we wanted to look at what our priorities would be under the policy. And then finally, any concerns or issues we may run into uh, because of the uniqueness of our environment. And so we looked for how to implement. We wanted to do some very specific and standard across the board rules one of which was everyone that's wearing uniform within the agency, from the chief all the way down to line-level staff, uh, if you're in a uniform and you're making contact with the public, you must wear a body-worn camera, and that one obviously must be provided to you by the organization. Uh, the big important thing behind that is, as you see in this next one, all of the metadata, videos, images, photos captured then are sole property of the uh, court environment and specifically the marshal unit. Uh, the office that are assigned cameras must follow uh, approved and are provided training. Uh, the training is both at the onset of them being provided with the cameras, but also uh, periodically to make sure that they continue to be effective in their use. Uh, this includes also daily checks to make sure that the equipment is working, uh, or sure that, uh, the uploading features and the um, uh, digital evidence uh, portion of our cameras are working to the standards that we have set. Uh, additionally, 
we wanted to make sure that the marshals understood the importance of this, not only the program and the purpose behind it, but also the fact that the responsibility for uh, the equipment and how they use it is on them. And so we wanted to make sure that we put them in that position where we could take ship of the program to make sure that it was uh, something that they were buying into and they were comfortable with. Next, we looked at the primary objectives. So we wanted to make sure that we hammered out a couple of very main purposes and reasons for the camera system. You'll notice uh, there's a very common theme on every one of these things, and it's mainly documentation. We knew that the body-worn cameras allowed for accurate documentation of law enforcement public contacts, uh, whether it could be uh, simple uh, interactions between individuals looking for directions or asking questions uh, up to arrest and critical incidents. They also served to enhance the accuracy of reports and testimony and writing. We knew that the ability for not only the agency, but also other law enforcement agencies, uh, the district attorney's office, our city attorney's office, was very important. And also to be able to use some of that information that we got from the body-worn camera recordings for evaluation and training of the program was also very high on our list. Uh, and finally, the real main thing is providing public or protecting public interest uh, by providing accurate depiction of interchanges. So just like the first part said, accurately documenting it, we wanted to make sure that once we documented that, that we protected the public's interest, uh, not only in being able to release that information uh, as necessary or needed, but also to protect their privacy interests uh, and make sure that when we're doing things like searching a home uh, or interacting with uh, juveniles, that we are not uh, accidentally or uh, insensitively releasing that information uh, that should not be released out in public. So when looking at how to document, we went back to each section and tried to hammer out how that would look. So for court security, uh, we basically mandated that all of our folks would activate their cameras in the following manner. Basically during all transporting of prisoners to and from our jail facilities. Uh, so that means anyone that was remanded inside the courtroom setting, but also uh, transporting prisoners from the jail to the court to appear on their court or during their court hearings. Uh, any one-on-one -on -one citizen contacts, uh, we put the, the asterisk there to make sure that our staff understood that private citizens did not include paid or volunteer staff working within the building uh, as long as they're working within accordance to their official duties. Uh, obviously, there are instances where perhaps a, an incident occurs where staff are fighting with one another, uh, or we had a couple of incidents where we actually had to do health and welfare checks on staff that had not called in. Uh, we could not get in touch with them, and so we made contact with them. Those are things that obviously we would want to keep track of and record for posterity in case there's ever uh, a question about the officer's the conduct during those situations. Additionally, uh, we wanted to make sure that the appearance of individuals in court, uh, which had previously been identified as disruptive or have engaged in conduct that could make them a possible problem, those folks who wanted to uh, make sure that we recorded as well. Now, it's it's very kind of narrow. So essentially, it's any transporting of prisoners, anytime someone's taken into custody, and or anybody that we believe is or could potentially cause a problem with them in the court. Those are the times that they activate their camera. We'll go into a little bit later why it's not more often than that because of some of the concerns that we have. But we also want to make sure that our staff do that immediately following those interactions that we outlined, they need to turn off their camera to avoid uh, recording anything that, that is not offensive, uh, i.e. any interaction between themselves and court staff or themselves and other uh, members of the agency. We looked at field service next. Uh, we wanted to do very similar uh, things for them. So as you'll notice, uh, again, it's transporting the prisoners to and from the city jail. Uh, during one-on-one -on -one private citizen contacts, which could, again, be any conversation they have with the public, whether it be um, enforcement related or not. Uh, and we, again, we had the, the underlying theme of private citizens uh, do not include our court staff. Uh, during searches of residences related to wanted persons or house arrest home visits uh, and during arrest situations inside and outside of the courthouse setting. Um, looking at those, you'll notice that between the two, there's a, a very um, similar need for both sections. And so we were able to 
to identify based on what our program priority should be along with what or how we wanted to implement it, we were able to kind of marry those two things together fairly well. So when looking at that, we, we felt very comfortable moving forward. The only other concern that we seem to still be looking at was um, how do we look at the concerns specifically to implementation and documentation in areas where we should not be. So anyone that's, that is familiar with a court environment, um, we really wanted to make sure, and you'll, you'll notice the two highlighted areas there dealt with our elected, our judges. We wanted to make sure that we were sensitive to uh, those things that were not public. Uh, specifically, we were looking at things like attorney-client privilege. Uh, we didn't want to interact or have a, a camera recording uh, as we're standing by with an in-custody and their attorneys talking to them because that would violate attorney-client privilege, obviously. The only exception to that rule would be if there's a competitive person uh, or there's a reason for us to believe we would need to use the camera, obviously, uh, per the policy, they would identify that person as potentially being a problem, and then they would be able to document it later on, the reason for the interaction and for the recording. Uh, additionally, things like bench conferences between attorneys and the judge. Uh, right now, we have a system inside our courthouses. We are a court of record, which means that everything is recorded. Uh, but even in those instances, uh, the recording is stopped within the courtroom, and so we wanted to be sensitive to that as well to make sure we didn't do that. Uh, but also, the big concern was the judicial chambers. So obviously, there's conversations that occur uh, off the record inside the judges' chambers, and there was a big concern about uh, staff walking in and talking to them and recording them uh, in their kind of candid moments. Now, we all may chuckle about that or think, well, what on earth are they talking about? But it would be really no different for us than officers on their break uh, talking to one another about something or in a locker room uh, and those are things that we may not necessarily have uh, any value in recording, obviously. And so we need to really take that into consideration. Um, additionally, undercover officers are confidential informants because we deal with those quite a bit. Um, and then, as I said, any other place where there's reasonable expectation of privacy. The thing that we, we were lucky with is Nevada law actually provides some direction for us when it comes to public records requests and how we can deal with some of those concerns. So specifically, Nevada law says that evidence is not public record. Um, and so if it's evidence being used uh, during the conviction of a crime, we do not have to release it until everything's all said and done. Uh, additionally, video recorded uh, juveniles or photographs of juveniles are always confidential. Uh, but really, the areas that were important to us were any recordings that were obtained within a non-public area. And the law specifically says home or non-public area of the business uh, or not public record. We have been able to interpret that and it's been upheld that areas in a secure part of the building, the courthouse where the public would not have access, we are able to redact uh, or explain why we were not recording in those areas, uh, especially if there's no enforcement action or concern. Additionally, things like photographs of police officers or video cannot be released without the officer consenting in writing. Uh, and then any other privacy concerns giving us a legitimate privacy interest. Uh, and specifically with that, we are able to extend a little bit further simply because not every aspect of what we do uh, is public domain when it comes to inside the courthouse. And therefore, again, that was able to be upheld that certain areas of the courthouse or certain instances where recording, uh, people may have wanted a recording, but it did not occur. We were able to cover it under the, the privacy request. So once all that was done, we were able to develop a fairly uh, all-encompassing policy to cover uh, our program and get our program off the ground. Those were the biggest areas. Uh, how do we make a program that's really kind of cookie cutter for traditional law enforcement and traditional policing and make it fit into the world that we work in? Uh, and so by breaking it down and looking at the different areas, uh, identifying what we really wanted to do with the, or the program, and then kind of laying out the parameters of it, we were able to do something that was pretty comprehensive. As you can see, once those initial areas were done, the rest of these uh, were fairly simple, simply because notification of whether we're recording, documenting, uh, limitations on the viewing, et cetera, et cetera, those are all things that are uh, in everyone's traditional policy around the world. Um, and so 
whether it's a specialized or a, a traditional law enforcement environment, um, this, these are the areas where we really had the least concern because they were the easiest to uh, translate over to what we did. Um, so with that, hopefully I, I was able to, to give some insight and we're going to move on to Sergeant Villarreal and deployment in K through 12 schools. All right, everybody, my name is Sergeant Eric Villarreal. I am currently the training supervisor for our department. Let me give you kind of a procedure of what's going on with our agency and give you kind of a rundown of what our agency went through for the development of our policy and the deployment of our body cameras. Our effective procedures that we're looking at our policies, how did we develop it? We, well, first thing is we went online uh, looking at what the body foreign camera toolkit. Our drafting of our policies had to be related and applied to the federal, state, and law, um, laws within our area. Of course, we actually worked with the law enforcement agencies, which is our district attorney's office and our county attorney. Uh, the reason being we deal with adults and a lot of juveniles, uh, the same way with the courts, media, and the public while we uh, develop policies. This is for us to develop and build a trust between the community and the officers as well, uh, doing all this process right, just the resemblance of our uh, introduction of what we're actually doing, our public needs to see that how we're developing our policy and our procedure dealing with the deployment of our body cameras, and we want to be transparent, that's what we're doing. Now, out of all this, we have to follow it through a policy development scorecard as well, and we have to address all those areas. For us in a school setting dealing in Texas, is that we have to present our policy that's already been cleared and updated through the Department of Justice and our legal team. We have to present everything to our school board for approval for the implementation and training of our officers. And in that, now the development as well, uh, procedures for the procurement process, this is very important that I understand and what I started learning in my experience in the procurement world is that we have to test out every single product that we're actually buying not only for the requirements for the Department of Justice, but at the same time to have a peace of mind is that you're fully deploying the product that you're actually initiating that you want to try for, and you want to get the best thing for the dollar as well. Now, highlighting the different types of body cameras, uh, equipment that we have with our officers, we trained our policy, uh, getting the feedback and everything, and one of the crucial points that we looked at here is the battery life. Uh, dealing with the body camera, even uh, also with the video resolution and the time limitations of recording. Battery life is very important, especially uh, for us here in the school setting because we're not in the uh, atmosphere of being out in patrol out in the field uh, like other agencies. All our reporting cases and our incidents happen within the school. So our officers won't be able to be changing the batteries constantly on a body camera. So the longevity of battery life is very important for us. Now we have to actually discuss the service options, the replacement, the repair cost, how is everything going to be, you know, projected with us, and we have to title everything right in the vendor contract. We also have to get the feedback from the officers. Is it really working? Uh, is it suitable in the field? Does it meet the needs of the field projection that you have? Does it feel the needs of where the deployment in your area is working correctly? Uh, to develop all these scenarios that, you know, deal with all the overcross that uh, that they're outside of our grant funding. Also, essential plans that we should need to discuss in the yearly project is that we have to consider it, how much is it going to be for the upgrades? What are we looking with the changes? Is the vendor contract extension, is it going to be an extension on it? Also, the things that we have here, are we actually going to go in a cloud setting or are we going in a, in a server setting? Uh, the backup system, the staffing, who's going to be in charge of your actual equipment? who's going to run it, and who's going to have everything here working for all the products that you're looking at. Because you're going to need staff to run your, your system if you're going to be running it in a cloud or a server setting to have all the backups from there. And how much is it going to cost you? We projected it with us. Well, how much are we going to spend in about five years? Um, as well, we're dealing with the training. Our policy has to stimulate that the, every officer that's required in the training has to be trained before the deployment of the cameras. We cannot deploy any officer with the body camera without the officer having a full understanding of what our policy is and how it's introduced in the field. Um, we have to have the uh, custom themselves to reality of using the equipment. Officers sometimes, this is the first thing that they have never dealt, dealt with, with an actual body camera. There's a lot of seasoned officers that it's going to be their first time of using an actual body camera as well. So we have to have a transition phase of what we're looking at there. Now, take your time in the training. They were explaining the importance of the tools here and the opportunity to enhance 
the job builds trust with our community. Our part here in taking our time is that your policy, how you're doing it, take your time with everything. Do not do everything in a hurry because what's going to happen, uh, our experience is that if we do our policy and our training uh, very fast and we don't implement all the corrections and the scenarios that we're looking at, there's going to be a po possibility that we're going to make a mistake in our, in our policy manuals. And when we look at that is that, you know, we might have some legal issues going on. So development in the policy procedure, I'd highly recommend please take your time and, and do um, network a lot with other federal agencies and state agencies that are working with bike cameras especially um, the ones that are actually already deployed with these agencies or dealing with the body cameras as well. For us in the training environment, we train our officers every six months dealing with the body cameras. Reason being, we don't know if there's going to be any other new updates pertaining to the training uh, with the body cameras in the state of Texas. There might be other Supreme Court laws that might take effect that we have to go from there. And uh, we have to look at that. And we have to look at the different approaches to addressing officers' concerns as well. The training and meeting with officers with uh, provide a vendor of allowing the officers to voice their concern. Okay, now that the officers are deploying the cameras, what's their concerns? They're looking at, do we have a privacy issue? Is our policy going to have any kind of coverage of dealing, you know, with simple conversations with one another? Is there going to be any kind of malfunction? And if there is, how do we report it in our policy manual? How do we report it as well? A situation awareness on this, we have to have our officers to feel comfortable of dealing with the deployment if they're, you know, involved in all phases of the policy uh, development and training the deployment and the community outreach, we have to look at that. Now, as well, is that we have to look at the public concerns. Our concerns should be a priority de developing with the policies, and we continue to have an intricate part for the entire process of dealing with the full deployment and beyond on that one, the media coverage, the presentations, we've already done that. We've communicated with the media what our expression is of dealing with the body cameras in an actual school setting. We've done presentations as well. The examples that we've done, we actually communicated with uh, the parent liaison that we have in our schools, and we presented to the parents uh, what we're actually doing in the implementation process and what we're actually looking at here. Um, our part is that we have to be transparent with the public, but as well as the, uh, transparent with the parents that we're in the actual school setting as well, so they don't have a kind of a different idea of what we're actually doing with our body cameras. Um, public has to be fully aware of our policy and privacy protection uh, pro uh, provided to them with the procedures, addressing open records, release of video footage, what they're allowed to see and what is actually police product. Not everything and anything that you have a recording is going to be pertaining to all that stuff dealing with the open records, but we have to be very careful in that situation especially in the training environment. Now our development procedures as well, when we get it rolled out, okay, we already have our policy in place. We're gonna have our vendors at our selections that we're gonna have with our vendors uh, deployment of the body camera. So now we're already phased in, we have a full implementation. Our options to be considered for deployment on the body car cameras, we have to check it as well. Well, after all these uh, scenarios are going on, we have to be well prepared to training scenarios. For us, we're looking at here, training scenarios that we're dealing with the body cameras, how is it going to work in an active shooter situation, a hostage negotiation, observe unlawful activities, for what capacities, and if it's, if it's able to actually do a full capacity of the limitations as well. If the camera is able to do everything that what it said it's supposed to be doing, we have to take it to the test, and we're looking at that. Now, our, our part here is that we, are, we have to have to prepare for a physician plan for unseen, unattended consequences. When you're doing an implementation of a body-worn camera and you're about to deploy it, you have to look at the future references. What if we have a budget cut? What if there's not, we don't have monies to have the storage costs? What future equipment we're going to need? Is there going to be any kind of staffing that we actually have with our employment of dealing with the body cameras? That's very vital and very important that we have to look at before you do your whole implementation of the process because you have to look at the dollars as well, is that what you're able to do and how much is it going to cost you in the future? Uh, and the reason we're doing that is because of actual experiences that we've had with our agency. Now, that's the implementation process for us that we've done, and it's currently going to be fine. Now, we actually changed the plan already, and we'll present the next presentation. It would be for Mr. Chief Book. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the fact that we've had several uh, presenters who have started us and taken us from the beginning of some research and then talked about very specific applications in different field areas.
uh, what I'm going to speak about is the generic aspect of starting a body-worn camera program and implementation, and then we will talk about some of the challenges and the limitations within higher education, and hopefully that will then allow those who are online to um, provide some questions uh, to us as presenters. So we know we're seeing body-worn cameras everywhere, we're seeing the technology everywhere, and there's not a single high-profile incident anywhere where we're not being asked by our prosecutors and our community and our stakeholders, hey, do you have footage of that particular incident? And we're at a point, Dr. Gobb talked about how those kind of those infancy days in 2014, we're now at a point moving forward where if you do not have footage, there's almost an expectation or an understanding or at least some perception that are we trying to hide something or do we not have footage for what particular you know, adverse reason? That's just not the case. Uh, while many agencies are already pursuing body-worn cameras, there are some, some challenges specifically related to cost that is going to take our bigger agencies some time to work through. So the technology is inevitable. We know it. I kind of liken it to the fact of uh, moving from revolvers in the 1980s and shotguns to semi-automatic uh, weapons today and rifles. We have to advance our technology, and in the case of body-worn cameras, the technology is moving very, very fast. Uh, another aspect of that inevitable technology is you're going to see links between our cameras and our tasers and our Bluetooth technology and our body-worn cameras all somewhat functioning seamlessly in the next uh, three to four years. So it's something to look at. So what is this list? This list is basically a smorgasbord of some of the primary factors that agencies should be looking at when you're thinking about implementing a body-worn camera. There are different factors for different agencies. I'm in higher education. We did not, when we were thinking about implementing in 2015, have a problem with accountability and trust with our college community. However, there's many agencies that have started their implementation process with that as their primary factor. Uh, I don't need to speak about which, you know, what some of those uh, communities are, but the nature of their business was they started the program because they were already under scrutiny based on their relationship with their respective communities. That is not the time to begin a body-worn camera program. Uh, for those who are on the line, if you're thinking about doing it, I'm hopeful that your relationships are already positive with your communities. And then you think about some of those other pros. For example, better evidence uh, for your agency, um, which could potentially result in better prosecution um, with your potential prosecutor. Better officer safety. Um, Dr. Gobb spoke about some research, and one of the real interesting areas of research related to officer safety is, is this in the future going to result in less use of force on officers and less use of force by officers? Or in fact, is it simply going to capture what we already have happening and allow us to reduce those incidents in the future? Very, very important. And then the aspect of training. I'm just commenting on a couple of these big aspects on the um, pros and cons. Training for our law enforcement is going to be bolstered by the fact that we now have the ability to review an incident Monday morning quarterback an incident, as much as I don't like the term, and then see what can we do better. On the con side, I can tell you for my particular agency, for a higher education agency, cost is a huge factor. Um, and it is really what are the recurring costs for a fastly changing technology. All right, so let's talk about this implementation process. Generically, I would consider this step one. Who are the stakeholders that an individual agency is going to surround themselves with so that they can put together a sound protocol to start the program? For us, I can tell you when we, when we implemented a stakeholder group, we are a grantee, um, and we had the Bureau of Justice Assistance, TTA, on the phone with us when we implemented our stakeholder group. These were the key agencies sitting around a table to tell us what were they looking for from the Santa Fe College Police Department when we were going to move forward. Certainly, the stakeholders should be every other law enforcement agency that you're partnering with or have mutual aid with. It should be the prosecutor and the defense attorney because there's going to be many, many technical aspects of transmission of data that's going to be important between you and those two stakeholders. 
For us, in the higher education dynamic, it's student government, our college senate, our faculty, staff, students, and visitors. And then lastly, and towards the bottom left of the slide that you're probably looking at, realize there are organizations that sometimes are at odds uh, with the law enforcement community. You want those organizations at the table to provide their input, good, bad, or indifference, because that's what the nature of community policing is. Hear the pros and cons from their perspective. Interestingly, I'll just comment on the ACLU in the infancy of body-worn cameras. The ACLU was um, nationwide telling law enforcement, absolutely, you should implement. We want the transparency. We want the accountability. We want to improve trust by seeing what law enforcement is doing. Well, now there's actually some discord within that, that nationwide organization, and it's a terrific organization because there are concerns that you're going to see in the next couple of slides that deal with what are we actually filming. And now that people are being filmed, are they actually uh, feeling like that's something that they want to see um, uh, on either our behalf or the organization's behalf? So make sure you understand step one, who your stakeholders are, assemble them, and move forward with the process. Step two. We all have state statutes and they're all different. Most currently, most state statutes related to body-worn camera programs are not well built out. This is the Florida state statute, the state that I'm in, and there is only really one statutory uh, aspect that we need to consider with two pieces, which I've highlighted on these, uh, with these particular arrows. And basically what it says is in Florida, if you have a body-worn camera program, you have to have policies. And number two, if you have a body-worn camera program, your staff must be able to view that footage. That's already kind of taken that out of the administrative protocol side of implementing a program. I know that we heard from Nevada and, and their statutes. I can tell you the state of Illinois has a state statutory provisions that basically overlap with procedures. So in other words, many of their aspects already tell them how they are going to operate those agencies in body-worn camera programs. Step two, get your state statute out, determine what your guide is. And then step three, I think uh, both Lieutenant Woolsey and Sergeant Villarreal uh, referred to this, the procedure and the policy being created before you put a single camera on a single officer so that we can protect our staff from making inadvertent mistakes. This is really important. The BWC scorecard that BJA provided has 41 bullets, 41 different best practices nationwide that tell us if you build out your procedure with these 41 uh, particular best practices, you're in good shape. 17 of them if you're a grantee are mandatory, but there's 41. This is a snapshot of our particular procedure where they helped us through. And we felt like it was really important to work through that best practice. The IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, also has a best practice um, template uh, procedure to follow. So step three, build your procedure by building coordinate best practices and use this template. Uh, so these next few slides will come rather rapidly to, to provide some time for our audience. There are critical questions when you put a camera on someone about who's wearing it. I like the fact that in the, um, the one agency we heard from, if someone's in uniform, that particular officer, that particular corporal, sergeant, lieutenant, captain, chief, you name it, is going to wear it. That's how it is in my agency also. If you have a uniform on, you have a body-worn camera. We're not going to make that distinction. There may be special events or unique situations. For example, we, there was some research that talked about um, undercover operations where you not where you may not be wearing those that type of information. Um, when are people going to take it on and off? The BJA uh, best practices bullets helps you determine when should it be activated, when should you turn it off. Uh, what are the privacy considerations? You film it during an IA. Should you film somebody who may be in various states of undress? Should you potentially provide some re-victimization to our sexual and domestic violence victims because they're painfully aware that they're being recorded and yet we need that information? When you implement, you're going to follow these particular aspects. You're going to figure out your piloting. You're going to figure out how to communicate it. 
think about these technical aspects of storage, retention, and redaction, and then you're going to assess your program. So the piloting port, the piloting port, excuse me, are these questions. That first question basically says, how intuitive can your law enforcement agency operate their program? If it is not easy to operate, I would recommend you pass on it. Can you replace your cameras and can you reduce your recurring costs by having a contract that you can build out for the next few years? Once you're locked in on some proprietary storage, are you going to be able to change vendors if you don't like what you see on the next two to three years? And then on the right side of this slide is some of the specific questions that deal with who will help you support, for example, legal and IT on the front end of your implementation. Uh, this is just an example I think is very important for those that are on the line to hear about. We wanted to make sure that at basically almost every stage of the process, our community knew what was going on. We had already assembled the stakeholders. We'd already had a couple meetings, but now it was time as how did we provide that information in a way that really leverages our agency. So when we applied for the grant, we kicked it out to the media. When we got the grant, we certainly kicked it out to the media. When we started piloting it, we had, you know, we, we told our officers, we, we provided the officers that were most comfortable with the technology, and we had the media ride along with them and say, we're just testing it out. We're figuring out the program. We implemented over a several month period, and the only time we did not communicate and disseminate was on the two to three months timeline where we were actually putting the body worn cameras on our personnel for good. In other words, we didn't tell the media, hey, today we are fully implemented. Our officers have just gotten body-worn cameras. Go check it out. Because we did not want to create additional scrutiny on our staff who were just learning the equipment. That was the one time we did not communicate and disseminate. In retrospect, that was a good idea. And three months later, once our officers are comfortable with the equipment, we again said, look, we've implemented. Everyone's carrying it. What would you like to know? And that, worked, that process worked out well for us. We're higher ed. Higher ed does not have a lot of complaints. We don't have a lot of use of force. So we had to figure out unique aspects of evaluating under a challenging uh, situation. This is a limitation of higher ed. You're not often going to have uh, the tremendous amount of interaction that a community or county may have with your public community that invites scrutiny on a body-worn camera program. So we did want to see if we got many public records requests. To date, we're getting virtually none. We did use student surveys to talk about accountability, transparency, and the others we're going to see um, in the next few months and, and understand what that means for us moving forward. What everybody on, the, um, on this phone call needs to determine is what ways are you going to evaluate the effectiveness of your program? All timelines are long. Dr. Gobb talked about when, this, when the uh, timeline started and agencies started to push forward on BWCs in 2013 and 2014. Ours started in 2015. This is really just give the audience a semblance of it's not going to occur quickly. And so be very strategic about your timeline, timeline when you move forward in a program. I think, um, Mr. Woodmancy, uh, that's it for my, my portion, and I'd like to turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Chief. Uh, excellent information from the panel. Uh, very good. We did have a couple questions come in, so uh, I'll throw it back to the panel with the time remaining, um, see what we can get to here. So the first question is, do any of the law enforcement agencies employ a person or persons specifically for video uh, recording, redaction, and editing? If so, what is their position title, what are they paid, uh, and where are they located? So I'll throw that to the entire panel if somebody wants to take a shot at that. Okay, this is uh, Sergeant Eric Villarreal over here with uh, Laredo ISD. We do have personnel in that area. This is how it works with us. So currently, they're called forensic specialists. But keep in mind, anything dealing with forensics, they have to have an extensive training in order for them to have that title. Um, they are located in the technology department because we are in a school setting. On that part, a, we do go hand in hand with them in regards to communications dealing with forensics. There are the people that are more trained in the environment of redaction, 
uh, audio recording or anything like that. The reason being for that is that they're specifically trained in that kind of environment. Um, this is also that you have to be very careful in that area as well because um, if you do go to court, you have to have an initiative because you're going to have, whether it be a defense attorney, trying to figure out, okay, well, you have these uh, people that are titled as forensics. What kind of training do they have? What certificates are they trained? And what are the possibilities of the exposure they have with this kind of training as well? That's one of, one of the big importance about it. You cannot title your safe or anything like that. It's with us in Texas. Uh, you, you're titled, as an example that I can give, a, a peace officer, you're titled as one. You have to have an enormous amount of training. You are required to be a state license within the state of Texas and uh, everything that has to be justified in Texas. Now, I do not know or feel well experienced in other states of how it's required, but with us here, uh, you have to look at all those alternatives and all those uh, questions that are going to be brought up in court, especially when you're dealing with uh, body-worn cameras. Thank you, Sergeant. Anybody else on the panel have anything additional on that question? Um, it's Robert Woolsey. So we, all of our, all of my sergeants uh, and basically my supervisory staff have access to do certain things, um, i.e. they can burn copies, they can send copies, because uh, we have the ability to actually send links to our prosecutors uh, so they can review the the evidence essentially in the videos, uh, but they also have access to do very basic maintenance and uh, if there's downloading issues, uh, those sort of things. So there's a handful of those folks, but we do have a specific IT person that we work with that is the only IT person, the only non-sworn staff member that has access to the system. Um, much like myself, they have administrative access so they actually can go in and do the more highly technical things. Uh, they maintain our servers. They make sure that any redaction that needs to occur, uh, any updates to the system, they do that as well. So while we don't, we have essentially one person that is that's there. It's not even a, a full time role. It's, it's maybe a part time role because they also handle some of our other technical aspects, such as our uh, in car computers and those sort of things. But they do focus strictly on that when we need them to. They do regular maintenance on the system. Um, but other than that, it's just it's just supervisory staff. And part of our policy requires that they go in and work with their officers on use of the body-worn camera and make sure that they're reviewing. So that's the reason why that is. So we, we didn't really have someone specific to do that except for the IT folks. But I have substantial staff that can actually assist with the program. Great. Thank you, Lieutenant. Um, let's try one more question. Uh, in reference to the privacy issue, do body-worn cameras that have the, quote, record after the fact, unquote, capability present additional concerns since they are basically passively recording when they are powered on? Uh, Lieutenant Woolsey, you want to continue with your thoughts on that, and then we'll turn it back to the panel. Sure. So one of the big concerns from staff uh, originally going into it was the record after the fact. Um, our cameras do a 60-second pre-record, um, and it, it constantly buffers all day. So it's it's constantly overwriting and rewriting all day long. The other kind of feature with our camera is we do have the ability to, using that, uh, go back and pull um, data from those cameras if for some reason our staff member forgets to or is unable to activate their camera, uh, the manufacturer actually can go back and pull that metadata off the camera. So for us, that was an important tool <coughs> because there are times where we would arrive on scene on something and immediately be in the middle of an event. And sometimes our officers will not have the time or the wherewithal, I suppose, to go ahead and activate their camera. But the concern with our, with our staff was, well, what about if I'm in the locker room or if I'm going to the restroom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so <clears throat> we were able to show that as an all-day buffer on that, we were able – it doesn't download. It doesn't go anywhere, even though it, it re-records over itself all day long. But also um, with our tagging and those sort of things, 
it's not really much of an issue. It's it's gotten more comfortable for our staff simply because uh, even if we do go in and review, we don't. I I haven't seen an issue, and we have not actually recorded any of those kind of private moments on camera. Um, simply because the camera is not set up that way. While it will buffer all day long, uh, it will only cover the areas where you activate it. So if I'm buffering for two hours in the morning and then suddenly I get in the middle of an event and I turn my camera on, it will have picked up a minute prior to the event forward uh, because it re-recorded over the area that it had originally recorded on, if that makes sense. Uh, and like I said, we can go back and pull the metadata, but it takes a lot of work, uh, and and we're lucky to have a camera that company that can do that. But truly, we only go that route in highly critical situations, and we can't access that internally. That has to go back to the manufacturer. For that. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, sir. And uh, we'll we'll wrap up with one final question. I think, Chief Book, this might be one that you can answer. Uh, the question is, can schools use the footage for their internal discipline with students? Uh, like if they show up late for class, they're arguing, smoking, uh, things like that. Is that allowed? Chief Book, want to take a shot at that one? Sure, that, that's an easy one. I'll start by saying this. Philosophically, if we start using our body-worn cameras because someone showed up late for class, we have a lot bigger issues in our college community. Um, but the reality is what's going to dictate the way footage can be used in every state is going to be their public records laws. So Florida is, is called government in the sunshine. Virtually everything we do, if it's not an active criminal investigation, becomes public record. So that means while we're not using it as an agency that way, as the Santa Fe College Police Department, the college itself or any other community stakeholder could ask for our footage if it's not an active criminal investigation, and they could use it in any way they choose under a public records request. So it's really going to be determined based on the, the statutory provisions in each state. Our first use of our body-worn camera um, that got re-reviewed happened to be an internal matter at the college where custodians left teenagers in one of our campuses uh, cleaning, and they claimed they did not leave them unsupervised. And we got a public records request from the college, which in fact showed that. We didn't care, uh, but um, again, state statutes will dictate that. Yes, they can be used that way. I hope law enforcement agencies are not going to be attempting to use them in that way. Thank you, Chief. And uh, we're winding down, so I want to just put some uh, closing comments on, uh, on what we did today. Our goal for the webinar was to provide you with some basic and helpful information and insights and best practices uh, with body-worn cameras when they were implemented with specialized personnel, specialized units, and agencies. Uh, what you heard today was the importance of body-worn camera research, unique operational dynamics and challenges with body-worn cameras in these units and special agencies, along with the importance of establishing partners and engaging with your stakeholders. And of course, how you could tell from the panel, the importance of solid leadership uh, for implementation and success. I want to thank BGA for making this webinar possible, along with the team from CNA, Denise Rodriguez, Samantha Reinerson, and Dr. Chip, Chip Colgren. And a special thanks to our expert panel. You did a great job. We appreciate that. And uh, with that, we're going to end the webinar with our appreciation for your attendance and your participation. Thank you, and we hope everyone has a good and safe weekend. Take care.